Hello and welcome to Beyond Reproach. This is Tux Lurzel. It's a me, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie Domingo, I'm sorry. This is my last time recording from, from Italy, so I, I have to take my liberties now. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> sorry to Thomas for the stumbles, but sorry to no one else. <laughs> I like how you began laughing at your joke before you even said it. <laughs> I am, like, I am, I am Rosie. I'm Rosie. <laughs> like I'm just thinking about how funny it's going to be, and I ruin it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I come to you. Oh, sorry, I'm stepping on you. No, it's all right. <clears throat> um, <laughs> what were you saying about Rosie? Oh, I'm just, I'm becoming her. She, she will laugh for a good minute and a half and then tell a story that's funny. <laughs> and then, oh my God, amazing. Yeah. Um, well, Stephanie is coming from Italy, but I'm coming to you from Detroit, Michigan, where I record on land belonging to the Ojibwe, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Wyandot nations. Yes, I am in Firenze, Italia. This is the last time I'm going to be recording here. Um, but yeah, I come to you um, from uh, Firenze, where I'm recording on land belonging to Proto-Italians. Mm -hmm. These are some of many nations still very much out here doing their thing, and we would like to acknowledge that. Hell yes. And for those of you who do not know, Beyond Reproach is a show about scandals and scandalousness in American politics and government. But today, we're doing a mini-thang. We are doing a mini thing. Last week, I I said that I was going to talk about some specifics of events related to Gladio and other places, but it's so murky and it's it's too big to do in a mini, especially in Italy. I I was trying to find just like one solitary issue that was tightly wrapped up in a in a little bow and there that does not exist um yeah there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen in italy the the too cia many too many cooks i mean imagine <laughs> in italy it was the cia together with italian security forces but also mi6 was there poking around doing their spook shit. Um, there were various right-wing Masonic lodges, the Vatican and the mafia all have degrees. Oh my yes. Yes. All have degrees in involvement throughout um, Gladio's 40 year run. So um, these are groups that aren't really known for their transparency. There's mm. just, it's just, it got really, really, really really sticky so i'm like i'm gonna do something else um so i mentioned in my scandal last week i talked about the oss the office yes. of strategic services the intelligence agency headed by william donovan that was later reorged into the cia you said that you were aware of the oss i mean i've heard of it i don't okay. really know anything were you about it did it like come up in re oh, research or anything? I was just curious. I don't even remember how I'd heard of it, but I, okay. yeah. It might've been um, Oliver Stone's documentary because he talks about oh, it. Oh, that's probably what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I am just like, I never, I never asked Tex where he, where he heard of it. So in this mini, I want to look at OSS weapons because mm. they're really, really out there. So before World War II, the U.S. government left the business of collecting, disseminating intelligence to foreign policy experts and elements within different branches of the armed services. Everything changed with Pearl Harbor. Okay. Yeah. The intelligence. They were like, it's not enough anymore. Yeah. They're like, we need experts. We need, we need spies. We need to know about things before they happen. Um, sure. Okay. So they, because of this, what they saw was a failure of intelligence. They established the OSS on June 13th, 1942. During the war, the OSS, as I said last week, they did a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They basically did spook shit. They managed intelligence, they performed targeted sabotage, they did propaganda, um, they organized and coordinated anti-Nazi res resistance groups in Europe, and they provided 
um, guerrilla training in Asia, amongst other things. Okay. Yeah. At the height of their influence, they employed 24,000 people. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's several. That's more than several, several many. <laughs> That's more than several many. It's true. So this is a, these were a lot of people doing James Bond type things in order to stop fascists. Mm -hmm. These covert servicemen, they needed tools. They needed weapons. There, there became a, a very big need to supply them with highly specialized um, equipment that can be taken into the field and used. Okay. So Donovan, he hired experts, he organized workshops, and he funded labs that would later become their R&D branch, the research and development branch of the OSS. And their job was just to fabricate weapons and specialized devices that can be used for officers. Um, everything was tested there first. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be getting into that later. There was There were some issues with testing. But the first head of R&D was a man from Boston, a chemist, who was kind of like a, like a, I don't know. He was like a, a mad scientist-like character. People okay. jo jokingly called him Dr. Moriarty. He's like the evil hmm. villain, villain in um, Sherlock Holmes. Okay. But he was, he was just a chemist in Boston, but he became the head of the R&D branch. Hmm. And he had, like like the OSS branch in Italy, he had the motto of, like, you didn't have to, um, to join the OSS, you didn't have to be crazy, but it helps. Like, that was <laughs> his kind of, um, that was his vibe. So on April 28th, 1943, Stanley, this is the, the chemist, he was asked to make a presentation in front of a pretty hostile group of um, Joint Chief Staff members. They were all very skeptical about the OSS. Okay. They didn't want, they, in the beginning, they basically, the, the higher, the higher ups wanted the OSS just to collect military intelligence. But they wanted to split like the, the guerrilla training and um, the covert ops. Um, they wanted to split that responsibility amongst the armed forces they're like okay the navy and the you know the army can help you with this like you guys like you you don't have the training for this sure so while he was explaining the purpose of the oss and why they needed government funding and like why they were the ones who should be in charge of this mission of protecting the country um he starts showing them different gadgets different tools and then he like He's reported to have like casually dropped a weapon into the trash can, a weapon called the Hetty, without anyone noticing. And it is a panic inducing explosive device in the shape of a firecracker. So after a few minutes, like it produced a loud shrieking noise followed by like a deafening boom. And everyone fled because no one knew what the fuck was happening. They didn't know <laughs> who was demoing this yeah. in a meeting. So after <laughs> this meeting was just like canceled, like, but he, he talked to the higher ups. And he's like, you know, that was a demo. That's like, just, you know, that's a taste of what I can do. And that's all they needed to see. I know. Yeah. How crazy. He set off an explosive at work. And without telling anyone, it without was like, oops, anyone. my bad. <laughs> but, but it worked. Cause they're just like, okay, we didn't even see you do it. And like that shit was scary. Mm hmm. So this this weapon was jokingly named Hetty after Hetty Lamar for her okay. ability to distract men. Uh huh. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. This is the first of um. This is a theme, just like really. I don't want to say stupid names, but maybe a little stupid <laughs> names. It's a lot of men having you know great ideas. So this. This weapon, this heady, it it actually did save a lot of lives. It is suspected to have saved a lot of lives um, for operatives in Europe and Asia because it was later deployed in the field. Lovell's team developed spy tools, right? Like he's mm -hmm. <laughs> he's demoing them at work, <laughs> and they they range from the banal to the extremely complex to the really really simple, but also just like. Really, really dumb. 
the R and D department, they also did a lot of just like forgeries. Like they would forge different identification badges um, and passes and like even like ration cards. And they, they, they printed counterfeit money too, like a la Upham. Yeah. So they were, they were doing a a little um, paper bullet making of their own. They, oh, foreign currency to like foreign, yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah, to flood the markets with with fake fake monies. Um, wow. I mean, it works. It works. Yeah. Um. So the Eastman Kodak Company, what we just know as uh, Kodak, they helped the OSS develop cameras like spy cams, uh, proto mm-hmm. spy cams, I should say. So they they made a camera as small as a matchbox that could be easily disguised by just adding a label that was appropriate to whatever country this matchbox was being used in. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about Kodak after the break because they were doing great things for the war effort, but also they were doing a bunch of fuck fuck shit as well as a Mm. big multinational corporation. They were, they were doing some bad things, but the OSS, their R and D department, it, Mostly developed weapons. Mostly. Okay. But they also had, you know, lock picks. They had little, um, like compasses. There's so many different types of compasses that could fit in like cufflinks or fit even mm. on uh, a button. So if okay. someone, uh, if a OSS serviceman, someone in the field is lost, like they can, they have a little compass on their, their outfit, which is pretty, pretty ingenious, I think. Yeah. So the OSS, they were the first to bulk produce weapons, which was the their main, was really the main event was, you know, weapons. So they produced the first silence pistol and the first oh. submachine guns that you can now buy at your local Walmart. Mm-hmm. They were Great. the first <laughs> to do all of Thanks that. Thanks for that. So I want to briefly talk about some of my favorite spy tech when we return from the break. Well, hello there. Do you wish your high school history course had more drinking, more swearing, and more ladies? Well, do we have the show for you. Her Story on the Rocks is a long-form podcast talking about good women, bad women, fictional women, and non-fictional women from all times and places. Basically, each week we pair two women who we research with a themed signature cocktail. You won't be sorry you listen to our latest episode. Available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Cheers! Cheers. And um, and we're back. Do you need Ooh. a break? No. Oh. <laughs> wow, <laughs> Tux just raised the roof you guys <laughs> he just raised the roof wow and you know parents just don't understand it is true, <laughs> it is true. and kids just don't understand that reference because they're yes. babies uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so i already mentioned a few devices kind of the boring ones the ones that really just make sense it's worth noting that much of what we know about these weapons that have all mostly been classified, uh, declassified rather, is from an OSS manual called Special Weapons and Devices. It came out in 1944. It is a disturbingly fun read. There's lots of um, <laughs> diagrams. And um, the CIA also, I got a lot of my information from the CIA. They have a, a museum and a website and yeah strange probably on the list yeah Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) (laughs) so we were already on that list that is true that's true i i just got bumped up a little bit yeah um it's like what's she looking at you made it onto that list when you were looking into the school of the americas Yeah, I couldn't even open up the browser. Anyways, yeah, crazy. So (laughs) the first weapon I want to talk about, it's called the Smatchet. Okie doke. Yes. I selected this one because I thought the name was hilarious. It reminds me of Smang It, that awful video you sent. Didn't you send me that video of the Smang It? I want to smash it and bang it? That rat video? Stop it. You didn't send that to me? I don't think that was me, no. Does not ring any bells. It can only be you. You're the only one who has anything. 
I mean, maybe it was. I've been inhaling a lot of lead paint fumes over the okay. last few months. <laughs> that, that would explain it, though. Anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in the show notes because it is very okay. important. It is material yes. to this. Maybe um, when I see it, I'll remember. So this smash it. Um, it's basically just a heavy sword. It's a it's like a short fighting knife, according to the CIA's website, and. <laughs> It's 16 and a half inches, including its grip. And it's basically a cross between a machete and a bolo. Like a, I think a bolo is um, like a Malaysian knife. It's kind of, I don't know. It's like leaf shaped almost. You've seen it, okay. I'm sure. Yeah. But what makes it different is that this, the entire blade is coated with a dull matte finish to prevent detection at night from stray reflections. What makes this knife special is that it's it's black, basically. Like it's a creepy shadow knife because okay. they didn't they didn't want any light catching it. And it's like it's really trippy to look at. Um hmm. my next on the list is a weapon called the Little Joe, because dogs can get it too. The OSS developed a way to put down dogs. They created what? a little I know a little crossbow. Um, it's essentially according to this uh, military historian whose website I found that he has really great photos on, on his site. I'm going to share some of them on Instagram, but he says it's essentially a handheld vertical profile pistol crossbow. For like security dogs. Yeah. For security dogs. Okay. Yeah. That sucks, but I, yeah. I, it, yeah. I guess. So it saw some action, but the OSS, they preferred to use um, modern weapons. They didn't like that it was like a, you had to kind of like pull it back. So they created a silenced gun, a silenced pistol. Just to get all these Rottweilers out here. Yeah. You know, it should have, they should have just done a Homer Simpson thing and said, these sausages will give me the quick energy I need to escape. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually... I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't interject here to just slightly correct the record and say I believe the line is These wieners will give me the quick energy I need to escape. Ugh, that's a terrible Homer impression. Stay in your lane, man. Ugh, back to the episode. What episode is that? It's when they're stealing the Dalmatians? A... I don't know. They're stealing something, but I think it might be a... Well, I don't know. Yeah. I was going to say I thought it might be a... Um... Treehouse of Horrors, but I think I'm getting two different episodes mixed up. Nope, you're absolutely right. It's the Treehouse of Horror where Homer travels back in time using the toaster. So next on the list is the Stinger, which it resembles the size and shape of a pen. It was a covert okay. gun that concealed a 22 short cartridge. So it was mm. it was designed to be single use. And you kind of like pull back this like lever and it like shoots a little a little dart but it's okay. but it's a bullet sure it had a lot of issues in the field it created a lot of hand damage there were a ton oh. of misfires but they iterated on it and it's estimated that in total there were 50,000 of these little um pen guns made during the war and they were used for spies so it's very possible sure. that like if these things did malfunction in the field like the spy was probably killed. So yeah. it's not like they were writing little field manuals like this misfired. It's like if it misfires, it's sure. they're, they're dead. But yeah. I'm sure I'm sure they use this one. But it was a very close range weapon. You had to be within a foot of a person. So it was very targeted. A foot? Yeah. Just stab them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Why why are we doing all of this? But you know, they had money for R and D, and sure. you know, it was I don't know, who knows. Um, so next on the list is the Sedgley OSS thirty eight glove pistol. This is another close range weapon, like the Stinger. It sounds like what it is. It is a glove with a pistol component on top, and um, it kept your hands warm. And when you made a fist. <laughs> I mean, that I assume it kept your hands warm. It would have kept my hands warm. But when you make a uh, fist is when it, it, it activated. Okay. Um, so as you're like what punching if you, someone, you're also shooting them for some reason. What if you accidentally made a fist? 
Well, then you would accidentally fire. <laughs> okay. I believe that there was only, like, you had two gloves, essentially. Or maybe you just had the one glove. I don't think they had, like, two. You know, I think you had sure. one free uh, hand, I assume. But I, I'm it, actually it not It was just sure. a regular glove, on the other hand. <laughs> yes. Um. So this is when this was... I mean, kind of superfluous, I think, but you know, whatever. Yeah. They're they're trying things. They're they're making sure. weapons. They're having fun. It's cute. Yeah. So <laughs> now moving on to bomb territory, we have um, Black Joe because everything has to have a stupid name. This mm-hmm. was a coal grenade, and um, yeah, it was a. It looked like a lump of coal. It was, but had a a bomb inside. It had a hollow iron casing, which seems so heavy. Like, how do you even? It also, it also seems like a strange thing to like just have on you. So it was like, if it were a lump of coal, why do you have a lump of coal? So it was intended to be shoveled into ships as sabotage. But also, why do you have coal in your pocket? weird okay yeah Yeah. it was their way of again this is so like it so if it were shoveled into the coal supply on a ship did it explode when it was incinerated i think it i think because it had that coating that it would take a moment like it would uh, allow the person to like get away or whatever before it exploded but but it was a grenade so okay. it would eventually go off. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Curious. Yeah. <laughs> this is giving me like um, green rain cloud vibes. Totally, right? Like, yes. Yeah. It, also, it was giving me Operation Ma- Mongoose. Yeah. Just yes, like yeah. Operation No Bad Ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, so next we have uh, a weapon called Aunt Jemima's. Shut up. Yes. It can be whipped into pancakes, but it would kill you if ignited. So it was an explosive powder that had the consistency of flour that was tasteless. It could be mixed with water and baked and even eaten without harm. It's only when ignited with a fuse that Aunt Jemima would detonate. So this was disguised in bo- uh, in bags of flour, and this powder was smuggled into Chinese, smuggled to Chinese soldiers in the resistance movement in Asia to to bring down, you know, Japan. Hmm. Yeah, this weapon is the one weapon that would get me. Because, yeah. because well, if somebody set your pancakes on fire, that's true. Yes. Next up is a weapon called Bino. Um. Strange name. So in 1944, it was assumed that most draft eligible men knew how to throw a baseball or at least could like, you know, pitch with some accuracy, I guess. So applying that logic, the OSS figured that if an American could throw a baseball, they could throw a grenade shaped as a baseball. Okay. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. Right. So they worked with Kodak who had switched from making little matchbox um, uh, cameras to making just weapons. They made a lot Mm -hmm. of fuses and um, they started making grenades, which sounds, you know, great for the war effort, et cetera, et cetera. But they had a huge German subsidiary that used enslaved Jewish people as labor and then funneled the proceeds in through... Switzerland, yeah, and the U.S. knew about it, and they're just like, it helps the war effort. Yeah. Jesus Christ! Yeah. Um. So yeah, Kodak and the U.S. and this Bino, all of it is piece of shit. <laughs> That's so fucked up. Now for the ridiculous. These are these are my favorite. Okay. <laughs> these are. Um. I just have two, and then I I talk a little bit about um uh like some just failure things. So my first, oh, this is incredible. Like this, again, straight men in a room having brilliant ideas. <laughs> so they created a bomb called Who Me? So it was, <laughs> it was not technically a bomb. It was, it was a weapon 
but it was not a lethal weapon, but it packed a punch to your nostrils. They developed like a stink bomb that according to, I found this writer who, who talked about this. Um, he wrote a whole book called, um, what's the book called? Yeah. So it's called Bastard Brigade, the true story of renegade scientists and spies who sabotaged the, na- the Nazi atomic bomb. So this substance was supposed to be syn- synthesized diarrhea. Like that's what they were going for. That's what <laughs> Lovell and his team were going for. Like in his, in the field manual, Lovell said that he had duplicated the revolting odor of a very loose bowel movement. <laughs> <laughs> very loose. Very loose. Gross. No. Ugh. Terrible, right? So to <laughs> test to test it out, because again, everything needs to be tested before it goes into the field. So they this is actually really fucked up. They hired Chinese children to dart out and like accidentally spray this like poo water on Japanese um, officers. It was also used in Germany after they created a pocket aerosol device that would just like, I guess, you know, atomize this poop water <laughs> secretly. So it was in, <laughs> it was intended. It's so fucking childish, right? Like it's very silly. Oh my God. So they, they created, um, this this spray and the goal was to spray it on a german officer quote quote humiliating him and by extension (laughs) you smell like poop yes and by extension demoralizing the occupying german forces (laughs) bitch what what everyone's gonna be like i quit the army my senior officer smells like poop right i mean it's so war over it is so silly that like i oh my god i started laughing i'm like this is so stupid um but this it didn't last very long they field tested it and they realized like this this shit is real dumb like this is not <laughs> like okay yeah but the wow. main issue was that because they use such a high quantity of um a very volatile sulfur compound that it was difficult to control so more often than not, the person who did the spraying also ended up smelling just as bad <laughs> as the person who was targeted. So and then they quit the war too. <laughs> yeah, basically. So after, everyone, everyone surrenders. Yeah, th- that's actually how the war ended. You guys, not many people know that. <laughs> everyone just smelled like poop, and they were like, "Okay, yeah, yeah. we've gone too White far." Flag. <laughs> <laughs> Oh so, my God. so they tested loose stools. Loose stools. Can you believe he wrote this shit down? A very loose bowel movement. <laughs> Ugh, sir, oh grow my. up. So after only two weeks of testing this, they 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 said no. We're not. This is we're not going to do this. This is real dumb, you guys. Like we all smell like poop right now. <laughs> <laughs> what have we done? So. So an honorable mention goes to uh, a cigarette that they created. They created a cigarette laced with the devil's lettuce to induce uncontrollable chattiness with enemy targets. <laughs> yeah. Uncontrollable chattiness. Yes. They were dosing people without their knowledge and recording them. So it so, literally it was just they were just giving people yes, joints. They were giving people and- joints. I mean, I guess it looked like a cigarette or whatever, but yeah. Sure. It's, but it's like you smoke it, you know it's not a cigarette. So I'm I'm confused. Yeah. It doesn't taste like tobacco in yeah. any way. Yeah. Or smell like tobacco or anything like that. They, I think that they came up with those, those cigarettes first and then they got the idea for the loose poop. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> you might be onto something. Yes. That, that does seem like the sequence of events. So, so my favorite failure was this is very similar to the the cloud that you mentioned like the the green rain that they uh-huh. tried to um they they thought of raining over uh Cuba outrageous so the OSS they spent government money trying to engineer a way to use insects to spread anthrax in Spain <laughs> yeah okay on some, yeah on some real like huh shit like it makes no sense um so Stanley Lovell, when asked about this, because everyone's just like, what are you even talking about? Like, we can't, 
control bees and like even if we yeah. did like they would die like what do you he was quoted saying that it was my policy to consider any method whatever might aid the war however unorthodox or untried um so so those are my faves and i i just mm -hmm. i wanted to do a fun mini for a chance i do want to talk about operation gladio in germany or ukraine after world war ii at some point but definitely not this season i have a question i was thinking about this yes. when i was uh listening or listening again to last week's episode um that clause in the like to sign up for nato that said like you weren't allowed to prosecute right fascist wing. terrorists yeah. yes um is that still a part of the agreement to get into nato i oh i i because <laughs> i'm like i don't know i don't think so. i don't know oh my god i, mean, I, I don't, hope not but also i don't like, think so i think there's <sighs> We don't really try and prosecute right wing terrorists. Yeah, that's no, no. I think so. I think it's. I don't think it's on the books anymore. But okay. I'm gonna. Yeah, because I'm gonna look into that though. I'll, <laughs> I'll put. I'll put something in the show notes. Well, thank you for that. That was a very entertaining um, mini sode. Yes. Um. Yeah, I'm better for the knowledge that we <laughs> were doing this kind of fuckery foolishness. Literally and just like, tomfoolery. Oh my god. Who me? Like you guys you really <laughs> think you're really fucking funny. Like Yeah. You are uncorrect. <laughs> Again, they were using those uh jazz cigarettes before Yeah. They totally were. Yeah. And everyone agreed and it was, yeah, raucous laughter. <laughs> um but right. thank you for telling that story and thank you guys so much for listening to Beyond Reproach. This has been Tux Lurzel. In oh, man, I was going to do, <laughs> do another Mario, but I, I like, I hesitated. I'm like, wait, I, they already know it's me. I don't know. People call me. Do Steph it anyways. Okay, it's a me, Stephanie saying goodbye, saying <laughs> Um People call Amazing. me Stefania here. Like, it's very ah. funny. Like, the it just auto corrects in their mind. I'll introduce myself as Stephanie. And then yeah. 20 minutes later, I'm answering to Stefania. <laughs> Amazing. It's like I, I know who they mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you also to our new audio editor, Thomas. We could not do this without him. Yes, it's true. Thank you and good night. Yes. <laughs> Ciao. Bye. Thank you for listening to Beyond Reproach. Please note that we are not historians or just a couple of drunks who never shut up and love history. A full list of all source information can be found in the show notes on our website. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe. Written reviews are especially important. If you like us, please do one of two things. Leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts or send this episode to a friend, family member, or someone who you think would be into it. Don't forget to follow us on social media and make sure you follow us on Instagram because we post our cocktail recipes the Thursday before each full episode. Please drink along with us if you are not driving. We also have a shop on beyondreproachpod.com. Get your merch, brand yourselves. And we also have exclusive content on Patreon where you can directly support the production of our show.